Scripture is Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 20. Working our way through the book of Acts, you'll notice if you look at the end of chapter 13, there's a lot of dramatic stuff that we weren't able to cover in last week's sermon that leads into what we're studying today. Let's begin at verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. They spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent, excuse me, so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derb and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand to your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all the nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples came around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derb. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are grateful for your word. We're thankful for every drop of blood and sweat and tear that went into bringing us the scripture today. We want to attend to it wholly. We want to attend to it with our whole hearts pray that you give us ears to hear, and I pray that you give me a mouth to speak. Help me to preach better than I'm able, Lord, and help us to listen better than we're able and help our hearts to be transformed by your love. We know the mission that drove these two forward is driving us still today. So give us your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my dad and I used to have a lot of fishing adventures together, and most of them were completely safe. You know, no harm. The most dangerous part of the trip was driving to the fishing spot and driving back. But there were a few trips I remember that were a bit more on the hazardous side of adventure. I'll never forget the sound of my dad falling on that boulder and breaking his rib and him deciding that he was going to drive home, even though I had my learner's permit. (laughs) He still would rather drive home with a broken rib than trust our lives to my driving. It was a quiet and painful trip home for him. There was also the trip down the Lower Deschutes River, down some class three and four rapids, and the thrill of the huge standing waves on Colorado Rapids, and then going by this rock in the class four rapid, Rattlesnake Rapids. Huge hydraulics, fast, big water, and a gigantic boulder that you just had to come inches away from. In a rubber raft, you might flip, but in a drift boat, your boat would be lost, and you might break arms, and who knows what could happen. I was thankful that my dad could row as we went by that rock. 
There's one time I thought we were going to buy the farm for sure. One time when I thought my dad has really lost it and we are not going to make it. That's when we went salmon fishing in the ocean out of Newport, Oregon. And in Newport, there's a big bay and then there are jetties that, that on either side at the entrance of the bay as it comes into the ocean. They called us the Jaws. Now, the tide was going out, meaning that it was like a huge river flowing out into the ocean and it made gigantic waves. And there happened to be a cargo ship coming in at the same time. So we were between the rocks and the cargo ship going so high up that I thought we were going to go off a cliff and so far down that we couldn't see where we were. And I just thought my dad has lost it in a little, you know, Lund type of skiff with a 15 or 20 horse motor. Out we went. But we caught some salmon. Now, when we were going in that death defying moment, or at least it scared the daylights out of me, when we were going there, we had four directions we could go. We could go forward, right, left, or back. Behind us was all this calm, flat water. Right or left would not have been a good choice with rocks and ship on either side. But we had a choice. We could have fished in the quiet water. But the reason we went through that experience is because we had a mission. We were there to catch salmon, not just to tootle around in the boat. We weren't going bird watching. We weren't going crabbing. We were there to catch salmon and they were out in the ocean. Now we see today Barnabas and Paul, who was just a little bit ago called Saul. He's now being called by his, uh, his Greek name. Like in Spanish class, my Spanish name was Bernardo, right? Dana, my mom called me in Spanish. I was Bernardo, but... <laughs> Here he is with his Greek name, Paul, all right? Now, Paul and Barnabas in this chapter, in this section of the chapter, are going through rough seas. They're going through rough water. But there's a reason they're doing it. It's because they know their mission. They've been sent out. And even though they could have stayed where it was safe, and even though they could have avoided all the conflict, after the worst happened, they kept going. So these are the three things that I see this section of scripture teaching us. I, I just like three point sermons because they help keep me on track. So here's your three points, three things I see from this section of scripture. Number one, we see the skill of Paul and Barnabas at work. Number two, we see the praise they receive. And number three, we see their perseverance. Now, it's been about 24 years since I started preaching the Bible to people for a job. Started out in youth ministry, and it's been my heart. That's all I've wanted to do. I haven't been able to do it full time this whole 24 years, but it's been all I've wanted to do. And I've been in a crowd when a preacher preaches and people rush to the front and they pray and they become followers of Christ. I brought my nephew to a big church in Sacramento and he went down to the front. I couldn't believe it. And I've brought youth group kids in that ministry in Seattle to concerts and they went down to the front and I've never really done that very much. I've been preaching for years and years, and maybe I could count on one hand the number of people that have come to Christ through my preaching, as far as I can tell. And I look at this and I think, man, wouldn't it be great to be able to preach so effectively that a great number of people believe? Now, this is, this is midstream. In the chapter before this, Paul and Barnabas are preaching. They preach one Sunday, a bunch, or Saturday, one Saturday, one Sabbath, a bunch of people come. The next Sabbath, even more. The third Sabbath, the whole city turns out, and that's when the jealousy starts, and that's when these threats of death begin, and it happens again where we picked up the reading. They were effective. Now, in this scripture and with what we know from history, I pick up these three things about their effectiveness. We'll tie this into the way the power of God is also working in this situation, but we can tell from Scripture and from history that both Barnabas and Saul were educated. They were taught under the rabbi Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel was such a respected rabbi that it was said of him, when he dies, the art of being a rabbi will die with him. Like he is the rabbi of rabbis. We see this in the scripture and also in what is spoken about his reputation, that he was a kind and generous man, that he spoke graciously, but a highly respected rabbi. And they both studied under him. They were educated. They prepared for years and years to understand what the Bible says. Now, in our, um, in our virtual world of 
of media, social media and whatnot, there's all these conversations and debates between atheists and Christians. And sometimes it's saddening how well the atheists know the Bible and how poorly the Christians do as they're responding. Now, the reason the atheists know the Bible so well is that they really want to refute it. You can't refute something you know nothing about if you want to be taken seriously. And so they learn diligently. Do we as Christians apply ourselves to know the scriptures that we're called to preach and defend? And I hope that we do. And there's hope that we will. That's what I get out of this is there's hope for me. 24 years into it, I can improve if these skills matter. Number one was education. Number two, they were bold. We see in the first section of scripture here in verse two, no, verse three. I'm sorry. It's, uh, no, it's verse, verse three. Yeah, verse three. Okay. So they're preaching. There's jealousy that happens and the opponents of the gospel come along and poison the minds of the crowds against the disciples. That's called slander, trash talk backbiting, being stabbed in the back. It happens to all of us. It's a part of daily life, but it happened to them because of the mission they were on and because of the effectiveness. There was jealousy against them. So their response was not to crawl away and hide, but to be bold. Now, to preach a savior who died on a cross is bold, period. For them to preach to the Jews, a savior that died on the cross is bold because the Jewish law says if you're hung on a tree, you're cursed. And to say that the Messiah was cursed is just the most ridiculous thing to the Jewish mind. It's just mind blowing. You have to really know the scriptures and really explain the scriptures to someone to convince them that it could be true. So it was bold to preach a Jewish Messiah hung on a cross. But it was bold to preach that to the Gentiles because they despised the cross, anyone who would be crucified was just a filthy criminal to be hated. The purpose of crucifixion with the Romans was to show that the enemy of the state was completely humiliated and destroyed. Thus is what happens to anyone who dares to stand against Caesar, stripped naked, powerless, and killed. And to say, that's our savior, that's our God, that was not the mindset of the Greek thinking. Their gods were uh, proud and could do whatever they pleased. So they were bold simply to have the message of the gospel. Third, they were also merciful and judicious in their speech. Now, I get this from the passage where Paul rushes out into the crowd that is about to offer sacrifices to them as a god and says, wait, wait, wait. He doesn't say he doesn't say, uh, you fools, God is going to strike you dead. You, you, know, you vermin, the ground is going to swallow you up. He says, wait, wait, wait. No, there's a mistake. And listen to the way he describes the nature of God. If I could get these glasses here. Friends, why are you doing this? We are only human like you. And this is how he describes God. God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let the nations go his own way, yet he's not left himself without testimony. Here's the mercy. He's shown you kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons, and he provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Wait, you're offending a God who fills you with joy. This is the God who's given you life. Now, it's true that in the beginning of the book of Acts, the apostles were bold and confrontive to the Jewish people in the city where Jesus was crucified. It was a bold and confrontive thing to say, you just crucified your Messiah. And when Stephen gave that speech and he said, you're slow of heart and uncircumcised of heart and you're killing the prophets, they stoned him to death. He was more firm with those who had more responsibility and more knowledge of the scriptures, but he was merciful with those who were outsiders. That's Wisdom and mercy put together, judicious and merciful speech. So, brothers and sisters, they spoke skillfully. They spoke in a way that was effective. Now, it wasn't simply effective because they were educated, because they were bold, and because they were merciful. But when they brought their best to the table, God brought his miracles to the table as well. You and I, and it's all of us, all of us have the same mission to make disciples. All of us have this mission. 
You and I, in our dealings with our loved ones and family members, and every bit of influence we have, we may give our very best and see a very small effect, or we may give our very best and see a very great effect. But at any rate, we should give our very best. There's some hope in learning all we can learn and being bold with the gospel and being judicious and wise and merciful in the way that we speak. That's the skill they had, and it led to praise. It led to great crowds coming and all kinds of affirmation. And it makes me think of the way we handle celebrity life in our culture. I really feel sorry for celebrities, honestly. And honestly, you know, celebrities sometimes do things that make you crazy and angry and this and that. But I feel sorry for them. Here's why. I'm going to use an illustration from the movie Where the Wild Things Are. I don't know if you ever saw that, but I love the book. I, I can't remember what day it is or people's names, but I can remember the pictures in the kid's book, Where the Wild Things Are. All the little monsters in the islands go. In this book, there's a little kid who, um, I think it's in a dream, he rows his boat off to an island, runs away from home and goes to an island. And there's all these monsters on this island. He becomes the king of the monsters. Well, in the movie, there's this scene where he is about to become the king of the monsters on the island where the wild things are. And the monsters are debating, like he's too small, he's no good. Oh, let's take him as a king. While they're debating, he looks down at some bones over the fire and says, are those the old kings? And the monsters are like, oh, I don't see any bones. Do you see any bones? So they crown him in the, the king, and then they say, fresh king, which doesn't mean seafood. It means like, hey, another one to devour. That's the way we handle fame. We lift people up on a pedestal and then devour them and demolish them and hate them. That's what happened to Paul and Barnabas. He could barely stop them from offering sacrifices to them as gods. Oh, these people are so great. Look what they did. Moments later, they stone them, they stone Paul to death, nearly to death, leave him for dead and drag him outside the city. I really don't know how Barnabas got off, how he escaped, but Paul was stoned and left for dead. So this is, is, is demonstrating that the praise that we receive can be a hazard. The praise that we give can be a hazard. But if we are humble and we return praise to God, then the Lord cannot even let that hazard come to bring us harm. God can bring us through it. It was that hazard of praise that brought them to the point of near defeat when Paul is left for dead outside the city. And I remember the first time I read this scripture and read about Paul being left for dead and thought about what that'd be like. And it really moved my heart to picture the disciples coming around him. Christians, people that believed in the God that he had just suffered for, just coming near him. And when they come near him, he gets up and walks right back into the city that tried to kill him. To me, this is just a picture of what small group ministry can do, what fellowship can do, what real Christian relationships can do. And yes, that was a shameless plug for the small group ministry. <laughs> I, I just love it. You know, there are times when we'll put somebody in the middle and nowadays we'll have to use copious amounts of hand sanitizer, but you could put your hands on their shoulder and pray for them and just if they're going through a hard time, you can surround them the way Paul was surrounded. And in their moments when they feel defeated, when they feel they can't go on, when they feel they've been destroyed and there's some hope in them that has died, just the presence of those who have the presence of God in them can bring them back to life. That's what you and I need. Every one of us need it. Every one of us goes through defeats and failures and times when we feel like everyone's against us. You've got to have that encouragement that comes from real relationships in Christ. And I know we don't always get it simply by coming into the church together. It's harder these days when we've got to talk through a mask and we don't have tea and fellowship time. But, and sometimes we're not even able to be together in person. But in whatever way you have to influence someone on a heart-to-heart -heart level, whether it's over the phone or in person, in a small group or walking in and out of the church, that's a chance that you have to bring somebody back to life, yeah. bring somebody back to perseverance. Now, Paul and Barnabas, they get up, 
They walk right back into the city, the city that built them up on a pedestal and tore them down to death, and then they keep going on their mission. The chapter ends with them moving through the rest of the cities that they intended to go through and going back to the church that sent them. It was a church that sent them out with fasting and prayer, a church that was willing to join with them in the sacrifice up front, willing to endure a little bit of the pain that they were being called into just to discern what God would have them do. And so, brothers and sisters, you and I are sharing a mission. We've got a mission together. God's mission has not ended. In our time and place, it's not so much that people haven't heard about Jesus. It's that they haven't heard about Jesus as he really is. They've heard about Jesus in a way that they have brushed off. And they've said, I'm not going to believe in that God. I'm not going to believe in the God that kills people dead for no reason. Of course, the enemy sows lies and says that God is bad and that human nature is good. But I'm not going to believe in that God. I'm not going to believe in the God that supported slavery and tried to keep women down and tried to do all these things. I'm not going to believe in the God that whatever it is or the God that didn't heal my neighbor. Our mission isn't necessarily for people to hear the name of Jesus for the first time, but to hear him as he really is for the first time. We'll need to be educated. We'll need to be bold. We'll need to be wise and judicious in the things that we say. We'll need to handle it when our stock value is jacked up too high. We'll need to handle it when we're crushed down too low in ways that we don't deserve. And we'll need each other. We'll need one another to come around when we feel defeated. So this is our mission together. May God give us strength to never, ever quit. Amen. Amen.